All right. I think we can get started. So welcome everyone to this week's Autonomy Talk. This week is a great pleasure to have with us Professor Giuseppe Loianno, who is an assistant professor at the New York University and is the director of the Agile Robotics and Perception Lab, uh, where he is working on autonomous micro aerial vehicles. Something about Giuseppe, he received his Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in Automation Engineering, both with honors from the University of Naples Federico II. And then he obtained uh, a bit uh, later his PhD in Computer and Control Engineering. He then was a lecturer, research scientist, and team leader at the General Robotics Automation Sensing and Perception, also known as GRASP Lab at UPenn. And, uh, and there uh, he, he looked at his research interests, which are uh, perception, learning, and control for autonomous robots. As you see from the bio, he has won a number of awards. I, I'm not going to mention all of them, but it's, <laughs> it's impressive. Uh, but the most recent are the Career Award and the DARPA Young Faculty Award, both uh, awarded in 2022. Um, in today's talk, he's going to talk about learning robot super autonomy. This is a, a very exciting topic and a very hot topic, and I'm excited to hear more about it. And that's why I give you the stage, Giuseppe. Thank you. Joelle, thank you very much for the invitation. I mean, as I mentioned, this is a great initiative and I hope, uh, you know, there, there, there'll be more in the future, more of this, uh, you know, this type of uh, events. Uh, so I've started my group, as Joelle was mentioning, in uh, late 2018, uh, before I was at GRASP, and then I moved to New York University, and, um, you know, we're working at the intersection of uh, perception, learning, and control, and so today I'm gonna, you know, just show you a little bit our recent results uh, in terms of, uh, you know, autonomy for uh, uh, mobile robot and especially we will focus on aerial robot that's what you know i like and also students are quite quite excited to work with so in terms of you know the the, the history of this field so i'm just mentioning you know aerial robot but in general this is also true for for ground robots so we started pretty much you know with robots with working in the motion capture system so really con in a confined environment, but where everything was pretty much known uh, in advance. Uh, and then there has been, you know, of, uh, research has pushed the boundaries, you know, in terms of autonomy of these platforms. And there have been also a wide range of programs, just for example, the DARPA FLA was one of them uh, that really aimed to push the autonomy and also the scale of this platform to make as small as, as, small as possible uh, to navigate, you know, in uh, in, um, in uh, cluttered environment and, you know, in absence of GPS uh, and so on. And more uh, recently, you see on the right side, for example, you know, we really went down with the scale of the platform. So basically we have uh, uh, a 20 centimeter, um, the audio is a bit noisy. Let me just, so. Uh, yeah, this was in the last uh, minute. Uh, I, I wanted to talk that as well. Uh, I cannot hear you anymore, Giuseppe. Giuseppe, can you hear me? Can't hear you anymore. Can, can you hear me audience... now? Is it better? Yeah, now it's good. And it's there's I cannot to hear be you no, no, Let's no... see one sec. Is it the phone? I cannot hear anyone. We much better. We okay, yeah. So you can hear me. Great. Better. So the um <laughs> you know the main uh, the main uh, uh, the main problem you know we were running this platform completely in dark environment so we really went down in terms of scale and uh, and we pushed the autonomy uh, the autonomy boundaries uh, in this case and at the same time you know we had the commercial world uh, that progress in parallel. So we had first, you know, DJI that was working with, uh, 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 you know, uh, making robots, especially for photography purposes. Uh, and then, you know, more companies, you know, have started to work in this area, like you know, well-known Skydio that's creating amazing autonomous robots. And 
uh, pretty much, you know, 10, 10, 20 years ago, no one would have probably bet that uh, an, an aerial and the ground robot would have gone on Mars and being completely, basically uh, autonomous. So, but there is, a, you know, in this kind of settings, what we see is that, you know, there is always a single robot uh, operating and more or less also the, uh, the speed is quite of, uh, you know, still uh, kind of uh, uh, limited. So, uh, what we are trying to achieve in my lab is what we call, you know, super autonomy. So in my opinion, you know, super autonomy it means, you know, these five characteristics. So we want robots to be unmanned, we want robots to be as small as possible. Uh, that also means sometimes agile. And, uh, you know, we want to have these uh, robot, you know, to collaborate with each other such that to be resilient as well to failure uh, um, of the system. And these, you know, will enable a wide range of applications going from search and rescue to agriculture, transportation and entertainment. And, uh, you know, the other areas are also contributing to uh, this vision. If you think about, you know, the availability of 5G and 6G, uh, this will basically boost, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the, the band, the available bandwidth will basically boost, you know, the fact that the the algorithm can be probably possibly outsourced to the cloud and uh, even uh, being faster. So we'll, we'll, we'll really be able to uh, be a man small um, in the future. And then, you know, you'll have millions of devices connected to each other. And, uh, you know, uh, this, is, this will be basically provided by the future uh, network. And so it's really supporting uh, this kind of, uh, of vision. In terms of, you know, but what's really the real bottleneck of the current autonomy pipeline and why this, in my opinion, doesn't work. So pretty much the current autonomy pipeline goes from the observation basically to the action through a sequence of blocks that are basically, you know, known as a planning, control, uh, perception and, you know, estimation. The main problem is that this kind of architecture is sort of sequential. So every block acts after one other. Um, but at the same time, it has the main advantage, you know, that many people can collaborate with each other. So basically, you know, you have a person working on planning, a person working on control, and also a person working on estimation, then probably they can merge this, this algorithm. But the main problem is that, you know, this algorithm are, uh, works at different level of abstraction. So each person needs to be able to integrate this algorithm with each other. They work with different types of representation. So, for example, if you think about the planning, it works with, you know, diff, uh, for example, voxel or other types of, you know, octomap and, and so on. While, for example, the lowest level of uh, localization works with point cloud. So we have different representation that are used uh, in this kind of, uh, in, in each of these algorithms, which increase basically the memory size and also the, uh, the, the computation. And, um, you know, and it's also brittle to adapt to different flight uh, and different navigation uh, condition. And this problem becomes more and more uh, uh, difficult and challenging once you scale the size of the platform, because basically you have really limited uh, computation uh, capabilities. And, uh, and probably every one of you has, or many of you have tried, you know, to scale from one platform to multiple platform, and then it becomes extremely difficult to manage this kind of uh, autonomy stack in, with, with, uh, with, with multiple robots. So what's the, in my opinion, the solution is what I call, you know, I mentioned super autonomy. So really, uh, in my opinion, we need to learn, uh, uh, you know, a way to strip tightly couple, you know, observation and, and, and actions. And, you know, this, in my opinion, turns into learning, you know, some models and representation, which possibly should be unified. Uh, so we want to unify the perception and, and action space and use control strategies that basically tightly couple perception and control. And uh, once we have, the, you know, these models and representation and, uh, and algorithm, this can be embedded, you know, in single robot and can lead to the creation of, you know, also collective intelligence uh, we, with algorithms that basically work at at, um, at an higher level um, uh, in in a more efficient uh, in a more efficient way. 
So we started to work on some of these topics and I'm gonna present, you know, a couple of them. So first of all, we started to work, for example, on, you know, the uh, uh, learning system dynamics. So uh, we're trying to learn, you know, the uh, directly this function H, which is a function of, you know, the state and the control input and parameterized by, uh, by, uh, by theta. And why I wanna do that, wanna do that, you know, because there are really, really uh, challenging conditions. So you can, in principle, using physics laws to model all these effects, but some of them are really very complex and it's very difficult to find uh, ways to, to, to basically uh, model them in an accurate way. So that's why we were, uh, you know, transitioning to uh, sort of more learning based data driven uh, techniques. And these, you know, can provide the quick adaptation uh, fast modeling and high performance control with the possibility, you know, in principle to scale to any type of platform. So what are the different approach that are used to uh, model these uh, dynamics? So basically we have generally three types of categories. We have nominal system identification, then we have residual learning and uh, model learning. So in the nominal system identification, we use a physics-based principle to basically model our system. And, uh, uh, you know, we need to basically accurate estimate the model parameter to get high performance control and uh, navigation. This is, you know, in principle possible, but, uh, you know, it's still an approximation of the reality. And in some of the, uh, the flight condition, these equations basically do not old uh, do not old and um, and that's why you know they are affected by strong nonlinearities and it's really hard to approximate to basically represent the, uh, the 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 full reality of the of our system in residual learning basically it's a mix of you know physics based uh, uh, equations with uh, with uh, uh, basically residual term that are basically data driven so we use this term, you know, classic uh, neural network to estimate the difference between the, the nominal model and, the, and the, 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 the true model, basically. And these are learned uh, in, in an online fashion. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's good because it's combining both approach in terms of learning techniques and in terms of, you know, physics-based principle. Uh, but the main problem is that, you know, the relationship between the true dynamics and these complex effects is assumed to be additive and uh, well known. Uh, so basically, in this case, you know, it's like you have the physics as an art constraint into your, uh, your uh, data driven approach. And the last uh, category is basically based on completely deep neural network. Uh, so we used basically purely uh, data to uh, model this kind of uh, uh, dynamics. Um, the nice thing is that you know you can you can uh, basically uh, leverage the full expressiveness of these uh, you know recent uh, neural techniques. But the main problem is that you know how does this generalize to outside the training distribution? Uh, and uh, you know. Um, this is you know, just a little bit of the uh, summary. So for example, you know, the nominal system identification, they are physically interpretable, they are computationally efficient, but they are strictly defined by the system parameters and they only approximate the true dynamics. Residual learning, it's still physics interpretable. It's a flexible techniques. It's, you know, data comes from the localization algorithm. So it's quite easy to uh, collect. You don't even have to label anything. And um, uh, however, you know, everything is additive and, uh, you know, uh, the physics based principle are used as art constraint. Model learning, it's, you know, purely data driven, is flexible and expressive. It's still self supervised, but, you know, it lacks of physics interpretation. And uh, there are still concerns on how it generalized to the outside the training distribution. So, what we propose is, you know, we propose, you know, to learn the continuous state dynamics basically using a, a sort of a neural architectures that basically it's composed by uh, an encoder decoder structure with the, you know temporal convolution to get the relationship between the 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 windows of um, the windows of states and the inputs that are given to the uh, to the network and a multilayered perceptor on the tax as a decoder structure and uh, you know to embed the physics knowledge that's the main problems and to better generalize outside the training distribution what we do is that we uh, we modify the original mean square error loss with the physics inspired loss so we combine basically the nominal model uh, loss with the mean squared error loss 
in this way. And uh, um, this basically an inject some kind of physics information inside the network, but it does it in a soft way and not in a sort of a hard way like the residual uh, learning approach was doing. And so we did some robustness study, you know, with respect to the effective prior. And you see that, you know, as soon as you have some uncertainty in the parameters, basically the, the uh, nominal model is not really able to generalize. The residual um, uh, approach, so we tried the same architecture, but used, you know, in the residual settings, it's definitely better. So these are variation, for example, of the inertia or of the um, propeller thrust, basically thrust coefficient. Uh, and we see that, you know, this physics inspired approach, which uh, has a physics embedded in a soft constraint, as a soft constraint, is basically able to uh, generalize much better compared to the other, uh, to the other um, uh, methods. And uh, what you see is that, you know, we embedded all of this in a model predictive control approach where we have this kind of neural network that now it's driving basically the, the, the system dynamics of, uh, of a model predictive control um, technique. And, uh, uh, you know, we, uh, we have this, uh, you know, kind of performance that show that, you know, the error is substantially uh, much better, much lower uh, compared to the, uh, to the nominal uh, model. And this was, you know, uh, kind of uh, kind of expected to the uh, due to the power of the uh, of the of the expressiveness of this uh, uh, this approach. Um, so what we did is really what we call offline learning. So we trained over a set of demonstration data that was previously uh, collected. The question is, can we adapt in real time? So can we sort of do what's called online learning? So adapt with uh, as soon as the con uh, with the operation of the platform when the condition change um, in, uh, uh, during navigation. And uh, actually, can we do even better? Can we do what's called active learning? So can we actively select basically action to, inf to influence what kind of data we used in the learning process? The, and uh, what we proposed recently is, you know, to generalize this, uh, uh, this MPC, neural MPC that I just showed you. And, uh, you know, this is the classic neural dynamics that we have to train. This is our model predictive control approach. That's, you know, predictive control state, uh, control uh, action and, and state. And uh, what we do in this case is we basically, uh, you know, com uh, uh, um, compute the error basically between the predicted state and the current state. And we use this error to continuously update the model uh, online. We actually do even more. We basically compute the, uh, the, uh, the, the sort of uncertainty of this network. And we bias basically the model predictive control with the, uh, this kind of uncertainty. So we weight the model predictive control with the uncertainty from the neural network. In this way, you know, we select certain types of actions. And so we sort of bias what kind of data should be used in this learning process here. Okay, so that's how we do this kind of thing. Many of you may 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 ask may ask you know can you do this with the classic uh, you know adaptive control technique? Yeah, the answer is yes. Uh, you can also do this kind of adaptation with with adaptive control techniques. But you know in case you use an MPC, and you know there there are many works that use MPC for example with adaptive control. But the main problem is that the MPC would in that case would use a wrong model to solve the optimization. So you will have suboptimal performance compared to the case where the model is continuously updated online and adapt you know, to the different navigation conditions. So again, we use the same MPC, but in this case, you know, we, we, uh, uh, the learn dynamics are very similar to the previous one. And then we, uh, we basically weight the MPC cost matrix with the uncertainty that's derived from the, uh, from the system. And what we see is that you know we have different types of uh, different types of uh, adaptation. In this case, you see that you know the robot has no idea that uh, it has a payload attached to it, and you know the adaptive approach show definitely lower error compared to the to the static one. We also compared in the paper with L1 adaptive control techniques and the performance are still uh, superior. Uh, this is the case, for example, of that we use four different propellers. So the robot has no idea about the, the different propellers that is using. And you see that is able to, you know, sort of stabilize uh, after a while. 
compared to the static case. And in this case, it's also adaptation to wind effects. This is a little bit more tricky due to the stochasticity of the, of the disturbance. So it takes a while to adapt, but it's still, you know, and it's a little bit more oscillation, as a little bit of uh, an oscillatory behavior compared to the other. And you can see that, you know, if we go to the end, it's quick, it's slowly adapting to the, to the system. So what we really did, you know, we exploit the data basically to improve the uh, the model of the system, and uh, you know this was improving, you know, the control performances and so on. We can also basically act on the control level and try to improve the performance of the control policy. So we took inspiration from recent works on, you know, ground rob, uh, I mean, uh, autonomous cars uh, racing. And we uh, extended, you know, this kind of work to uh, kind of aerial uh, vehicles. And so what we propose, you know, it's to learn to race. So this was a minimum time learning, a minimum time control problem to the, uh, to the, to the goal, to the gate. Uh, so the robot was basically, you know, flying from an initial location to a final location without having, uh, you know, any information about the, its trajectories. It was collecting some samples and then uh, iteration by iteration, it was improving uh, basically the, uh, the time performance to the, to the goal. Uh, so the formulation is very much similar to the, you know, the classic MPC, it's an iterative MPC, so we have basically based on the uh, nonlinear dynamics of the system, possible actuator sensor or obstacle avoidance constraint. Uh, also, we have, uh, you know, the initial condition and then, you know, we have as a constraint that the final state needs to be in a safety set, so that's the uh, the the formulation. So this is, you know, the cost that's used for the uh, for these for the specific problem that we are trying to address. So the first cost, you know, penalize if the agent has not reached the goal. The second cost penalize the control command magnitude, and that's the final cost that minimizes the time to go to the terminal uh, state. So what we do is that, you know, to give you an illustration, we perform very different trajectories. We collect only the successful one. We collect the cost to go. And then we build, you know, the collection of state of successful trajectories. So all the, all the states along the successful trials were basically collected. And then these basically perform, uh, constitutes the safety set. The only problem is that, you know, the memory grows quickly and it's still a nonlinear mixed integer uh, pro uh, programming. So it's very difficult to solve in real time. So we do what's called a convex approximation, you know, and local approximation of this safety set. So what we do is that, you know, we approximate this kind of uh, system locally. And so the really the idea to give you any intuition is that the system goes um, is doing a, um, a sort of balance between exploration and exploitation. So basically it's trying to explore with the final condition that the final states needs to be in a safe, in a safe region that was previously visited. So it's trying to explore in this area. Meanwhile, it reached basically the final, the final, uh, um, the final area. And uh, uh, we see that, you know, we approximate also the, the, uh, the, the, the safety set with the convex uh, one. And uh, it becomes, you know, very efficient to solve. And, uh, you know, this is a video where we solve this system in, in real uh, and works in real time. So the idea is that the robot starts from this location, ends up to the final location and needs to be in the virtual corridor uh, that you have seen. And you see that, uh, you know, iteration by iteration, you will see that the system is able to uh, to learn sort of uh, uh, the, the fastest trajectory to go to the, uh, to the, to the end gate. Uh, and you can see that, you know, already at the sixth iteration, it does a much better job than the, uh, the, the second, the third, and uh, it's basically learning how to cut the curves. And, uh, you know, we didn't have a big lab to do that. So at that time, now we have a bigger one. So we also tried in simulation. And you can see that, you know, at the sixth iteration, the robot is able to cut the corners of this zigzag uh, path. So to find much more efficient uh, ways to get to the final goal. So this concludes a little bit the parts that's related to the single robot. And then, you know, the, the second part of this talk is more related to, you know, what are we doing in terms of uh, multi-robot and what I call collective intelligence. So we are still using this kind of learning techniques, but, you know, at multi-robot uh, level for problems, you know, related to, um, to multi-view perceptions. Uh, but also to problems related to multi-target uh, tracking. 
And you know, there are a wide range of uh, applications related to search and rescue, site inspection, and perimeter defense that can benefit from uh, these techniques. And you know, it's uh, it's having multi -rob multiple robots and multiple sensor will also improve the you know the efficiency of the uh, of the task as well as the resilience to uh, to failure. So in um, in this first approach, what we're trying you know to achieve is to have a system of robots you know that uh, would in the future would navigate together. But in this case, you know, we had the system of robots that. Um, wanted to solve a multi-view perception problem. So basically, you know, they want to, uh, on each, each one of them is required to reconstruct, in this case, the semantic of the environment and the depth of the environment. But some of these robots basically have corrupted uh, information. So you see that pretty much these robots as the complete, the image is completely noisy. This one is blurred. And in this case, it's also quite, quite dark. So the idea was, the, you know, is there a way to combine the information from the different unit without, uh, you know, any human uh, and crafting and in a, in a seamless way so that the robot, you know, that are suffering from, you know, inconsistency in terms of sensing data can, you know, recover their capability and, and finalize their task. So what we propose is, you know, to use recent neural techniques that are based on graph neural network that basically what each technique that what what each uh, robot does is basically it's encoding the information into low level features there is a sort of message passing that's happening among each robot at different level of abstraction and then on each robot uh, on each at the end of each robot there is also a decoder that's you know combining the information from the different sources and it's decoding into the task that was initially uh, you know, established. In this case, it was, uh, was uh, you know, depth estimation or semantic segmentation of the uh, environment. So we have different ways of, you know, combining the information. One is, you know, you can share the pose between the robot. If you don't have, the, you know, this information, you can also try some kind of cross attention uh, technique. And what we notice, you know, we're, I mean, I was very surprised when I saw this, especially from uh, when my students, you know, propose these kind of techniques. And you can see that, you know, these are five robots. One is, you know, completely, cor actually a couple of them are completely corrupted. And despite it's completely corrupted, you know, the single robot is not able to do anything. While, you know, once the information is shared between the different robot, basically the robot is able to, to reconstruct its original, um, uh, its original, uh, uh, you know, uh, segmentation uh, task. So it's basically able to recover uh, that approach. Even more visible is that if we go on real data, I believe we're one of the first to try on real data, if not the first. And you can see that, you know, one of the images, we have five robots, one of the images completely corrupted. So the single robot baseline is not able to do anything, but sharing the information, you know, with other robots, is able to basically reconstruct the entire depth of the environment. And you can see even later, you know, we have really small details, like, uh, you know, sort of edges in this case. And, you know, the single robot cannot do anything. Uh, the boundaries are completely blurred. Uh, while in this case, you know, basically we have reconstructed the entire, uh, the entire depth of, of the environment just by exchanging, you know, low level features between uh, each other without any uh, specific human uh, and crafting. So in the future, we're really uh, excited to move this forward, you know, toward heterogeneous sensing. So right now we just tried, you know, visual. We, want, we would like to extend to visual and, and other type of uh, uh, sensor information, possibly making it, you know, seamless uh, with respect to the sensors that you have. And also embed in this kind of, you know, information that's message passing between uh, the robot, not only perception information, but also action information. So we can really couple basically the perception action sensing for multi-robot uh, system. Um, another work that you know we have uh, we have addressed is that you know you have multiple robots. So how do you uh, make sure that you know you can track each other uh, in to, and you know this has been one of the main problem for multi robot control and uh, and the navigation. So what we propose here you know multi robot relative tracking uh, strategy. 
And you know, each robot receives a set of measurements that are those red dot, the red cross. But you know, it doesn't really know which measurement belongs to which one of the ID that the robot has in its memory. For example, robot one is seeing this as robot two and robot three, but it doesn't really know once it gets once the robot gets some certain measurement. So red crosses, which one belongs to the red to the number two and which one belongs to number three, right? So what we did is that you know we proposed to, uh, different Bayesian uh, techniques to uh, to solve this kind of problem, which is modeled in this case directly in the image with the constant velocity model with with the rotation compensation. Since we have IMU information, which makes it makes it much more robust uh, to uh, to rotation of the camera. So the real question is that how we can associate a given measurement to a track. So how can we associate each one of these red cross to the green, uh, you know, track that the, the robot has in memory. So the first approach, you know, would be used to the would be to use the classic Kalman filter. So it's you know we pick the maximum posterior distribution with respect to the state and measurement. The second approach would be a joint probabilistic data association filter. So we compute all the possible probabilities between the current uh, you know, measurement and all the tracks. And we establish a weight for each one of these uh, cases. And then we use all the measurement to update each track weighted by the corresponding probability that was fine for each one of these combinations. And then the last one is the PhD filter. So we use a random finance set rather than all the possible matches to model the relationship between track and measurement. So it's in this case, a combination of Gaussian similar to particle filter that's used to model this kind of, uh, you know, relationship between the measurements and state. So we compared all these kind of, you know, techniques uh, with respect to clutter, false positive Gaussian noise and computation. And you can see that in general, you know, for small teams, uh, it's still, uh, it's very, I mean, we don't use any more Kalman filter because in this case, you know, even for the clutter or for, you know, cro robots crossing each other, it was not able to keep the track. So the track were completely switching. So we noticed that, you know, despite Kalman filter, well known to be computationally efficient, it cannot really be robust to solve this kind of problem. And then we tried, you know, two different techniques that were, you know, the JPDAF and the PhD. And you can see that for small number of drones, basically the the the, the JPDAF is is still more efficient the 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 PH the, compared to the PhD. But uh, you know, uh, if we look at the other three metrics, which is false positive, false negative, and noise, we see that for large noise, you know, the uh, the PhD is preferable. Also for large, you know, false uh, negative. And, uh, you know, in terms of clutter, uh, we still have, you know, that for moderate clutter, the JPDAF is still better than the, 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 the PH, uh, it's, it, it's still better than the PhD. In general, you know, if you have small teams, probably the JPDAF is the best approach, but if you really have large teams, it's becoming computationally inefficient, so you cannot really run uh, on board. So we release, you know, the code, for all these settings, if you are interested, you can look on the GitHub repository of the lab. And, you know, in this case, it's quite clear. So we, you can see that at the beginning, you know, we have sort of all unsorted measurement and we have eight uh, tracks and the robot doesn't know which of his measurement is corresponding to which one of these track. So even when the, they cross each other, we are able to basically not miss the track and, and having the track not switching with respect to uh, each other. We also implemented this on the real system. So we had a team of aerial robots. We, you know, run a detector with the, with the recent deep neural network based on CenterNet. And then we basically compare dif these different, uh, you know, um, uh, techniques with the three aerial robots. First two, we compare, for example, in this case, the clutter and uh, um, are really crossing each other. And uh, then we go also to three robots and you can see that there are three robots navigating in the environment and we're still able to recognize, you know, the different types of robots and, and so on. And the other great thing is that, you know, we have also a consensus algorithm. So we ensure that, for example, if number one sees two and three as this robot, number three is the same 
uh, robot for num robot number one and robot number two in this view. So we have, you know, a consensus on the IDs across all the robots, which is not always needed for, you know, flogging algorithm or other types of approach, but might be useful in different uh, application. And you can see here, you know, that we certainly the computation time is lower for the Kalman filter, but the errors are quite huge. And, you know, the track completely switch in case, uh, you know, you have robots crossing each other. Then I want to conclude, you know, that when we talk about collective intelligence, many people just think about, you know, swarm of robots flying and, you know, doing inspection or collaborating in a task like, you know, na uh, navigation or, you know, environment reconstruction. But there is also a large body of work of having multiple robots that physically interact with each other and physically interact with the environment. And I think in the future, you know, what's going to be very interesting is how this robot will, you know, um, will be able to be autonomous. So uh, because compared to the other case, you have physical constraint among the robot. And this play a big role when you need to work in terms of perception and action, because basically the mechanics of the system really affects basically the perception algorithm. A small error on perception on one robot can destabilize the entire system because, you know, small drift, the robot may think that in the same position and then the system basically, you know, start to be destabilized due to the physical interconnection among the robot. It's, uh, so it's really challenging to uh, design this kind of system and especially, you know, to interact with humans. You know, one robot is probably still feasible, but when you do multiple robots, there are concerns about safety and, uh, you know, about the ability to coordinate and orchestrate with, uh, with the human. So in our, one of our recent work, you know, we try to put all of these together. So can we have a system of, you know, robots transporting a load that's assisting a human, you know, in a transportation task or in a manipulation task? And you may think this as, you know, the future of warehouse automation, where you have multiple robots that they need to interact with human, manipulate objects, put them on the, some scaffolding and so on. And so what we're really uh, uh, in trying to investigate in this case were, you know, three type of uh, uh, elements. So first of all, we want to guarantee the safety of the human. So we wanna, in this case, you know, this translated in uh, keeping the original task for the robot, but having the robot as far as possible from the human, uh, the, the, from the human to increase its safety. Then at the same time, we want to, you know, detect the interaction between the human and this structure. And this is extremely hard uh, because, you know, the, the payload has no sensors. So can we do that uh, just by uh, indirectly, just by, you know, maybe using the tension of the uh, different cables. And this is done basically in what we call a payload branch estimator. So we're really able to understand indirectly how we can estimate the force and moments on the, on the structure. And then the structure should also be compliant to this kind of motion. So we need really to generate a new type of admittance control uh, that's basically allowing the system to be compliant with respect to user uh, interaction. So what we did, you know, I'm just going to briefly mention the safety aware module is that, you know, we exploited the redundancy inside the, uh, the system uh, to basically, you know, find a set of uh, cable tensions that were not modifying, you know, the that when added to the original uh, desired cable tensions, they were basically modifying the cable directions, but they were not modifying the, you know, the position and orientation of the load. So there is a family of, of uh, cable tensions that exist for each task that can be used basically to increase the safety of the uh, of the, the distance between the human and this kind of robot. So we propose, you know, two different types of techniques. In this case, you know, the classic gradient-based uh, safety controller and an optimization-based safety controller. So in the first one, uh, you know, it's, it's basically, this is inherited from the classic manipulators, robot manipulators. So we basically, you know, define a cost function, which is nothing else that en encoding the distance between the, 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 the robots and the humans. And we basically try to maximize the distance between the robots and the, uh, the human. 
Um, in the second case, we uh, you know design an optimization based techniques. So we really look, uh, you know, at uh, in this case we cannot only specify the distance between the uh, robot, uh, sorry, the distance between the uh, the uh, maximize the distance from the uh, human, but we can also express a specific distance between the robots. So in these optimization techniques, we can actually do more compared to what we were doing with the classic, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, gradient based uh, controller. And you can see that you know once we add this tension to this kind of mapping, basically since it goes into the null space of the of, of the, the of the transformation, basically we have that the uh, it doesn't contribute to the force and moments, but it definitely contribute to increase the safety of the user. So, what is the pros and cons of this kind of approach? The first one is you know computationally lightweight. It tries to maximize the distance till it reach some uh, boundaries which is the good advantage. Uh, so it's simple and efficient. The second one can specify a distance between the robot and also between robot and objects, but it's a nonlinear optimization approach. So it takes a little bit more time to solve. For small number of robots, honestly, there is not much difference, but when you have a larger team, this may make a difference. And so the second approach, optimization-based safety controller may require more computational time. And so I want to show you a little bit the experiments that we did. The probably, you know, this has been one of the first with multiple robots. You can see that initially the user approach and, you know, the robots are close to each other. And once this is detected, you know, the robot extend with respect to the, the original location to maximize the safety. And then, you know, they assist the human during these transportation tasks. So we see that the robot, the, 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 the the robot assists the human transporting the object, so the structure is compliant. Uh, we end to the final, you know, destination, and then the robots can land. But then we told ourselves, you know, does always do always the robot needs to help the human? Can the human help actually on the other end the robots? And actually, that's also the case. For example, you will see in the next video where there is an obstacle, and then we let the you know the human deviates the original trajectory of the uh, of the load. And you can see that uh, you know the, the the in this case the human is actually assisting the uh, the robot in this kind of uh, settings, and uh, you know it, the robot after it deviates from the original trajectory successfully returns uh, you know to uh, to its original uh, to its original path. Of course, now we are still you know in kind of motion capture system settings. In the future, we're really looking to extend this to a fully autonomous settings, maybe also improving the user cognitive level with uh, mixed reality and uh, optic uh, interfaces. So we are working toward this direction. So uh, this is, I'm going toward the end, you know, my talk. So really I, I try to show a path that's going from the single robot to a multiple robot. And now we can change, you know, the autonomy structure of each robot to be beneficial uh, and being used, you know, for uh, multiple robots uh, settings. Uh, so I profit of this time also to thank you, uh, my students, as uh, all of them, especially, you know, who uh, the work I presented belong to Warre, Young, uh, Alessandro, and uh, a little bit Jeff as well. Um, and, uh, you know, several researchers that works in the lab and also master student that tremendously help us when we need to do the, you know, setting all these robots is very complex. So we need sort of pipeline going from production to, uh, to you know, deployment. And they are very useful, you know, for this kind of, uh, of approach. And also I profit to thank also all my uh, sponsors that are currently supporting the, the lab. And, uh, you know, I'm thank you very much for joining and I'm open to uh, questions from the audience. Thank you, Giuseppe, for the great talk, a lot of cool insights. Uh, let's open I the stage for questions Wait now. It's weird. Okay, can, can everybody else hear me? Uh, okay, can you? Can, can, can you hear me now? Good, nice. Yeah. Good. Okay, great, great. Yes, yes. So I was oh, saying was uh, thank you very much for... Thank you. <laughs> no, but well, we could hear you well. Okay, So good. thank you great. for, for <laughs> the talk. Let's open the stage for questions. You can either type them in the chat and I will read them for you, or you can uh, raise your hand and I will call you and you can ask directly. So let's see who wants to start. Do 
there's always trouble finding the first icebreaker. <laughs> Maybe, okay, let, let me then start. Um, I, I, I was really amazed by the number of applications you have all the way from the single platform to the more, to the network, let's say, of robots. Um, now, my question is a bit general maybe, but it's, uh, I've been seeing a lot of people working on, on learning-based approaches or mixed approaches uh, to, to target a particular task. For instance, one that comes to mind is Karamutsa doing these uh, races or uh, learning these behaviors for very specific tasks. Now, what is your take on generalizing these things to, to classes of tasks or to to missions that are a bit more complicated? I know it's a general answer, uh, question, but... No, no, that's, that's, that? uh, that's totally right. So in my, my take on that is that, you know, and uh, is in the first part of the uh, talk is, you know, in the pipeline, how it's currently, uh, you know, implemented. So pretty much the current pipeline is great, but it integrates a series of modules that people just put together without really uh, trying to get the cross relationship between the modules or if they or if they are done they are approximated my real vision is you know that what we're trying to do is to learn directly the task in the perception space so what we'd like to do is to to build models and representations that do not work anymore you know in the co original configuration space of the robot but they work you know in the perception space and probably can generalize also to different perception space. So we want, you know, work with the uh, seamless with LIDAR uh, cameras and, and so on. And so having tasks that basically, you know, relying on what similar to what the human does, you know, you have a reference, probably image or reference, uh, you know, per, uh, uh, perception data, and you want to find a way to uh, move from the current configuration to the uh, final one. And what people have been doing and, you know, has been quite good is approach based on reinforcement learning. So basically end to end. Uh, but this has the problem that, in my opinion, in many cases, it's not really understandable what's happening inside. So in this way, if you learn the model and you learn the model in the perception space and so on, and then you apply this to more traditional control techniques like predictive control and so on, in my opinion, it becomes, you know, uh, um, we, we can also understand when there is a failure, why there is a failure, and probably even generalize better in the future rather than, you know, having sort of black box that we don't know what's really happening, basically. Okay, thank you. This, this answers my question. <laughs> uh, is, is there another question from the audience? Also, we have started on that vision. I didn't present. We have some preliminary results for moving targets. It's really hard to generalize to multiple to, to general scenes, especially if they are dynamic. So we started with a single target to do that. Then we want to extend to general st a static scene. And then after that, we want to do static and dynamic uh, scene so that your model basically automatically understand, uh, you know, in which type of environment it's working in. Okay, I see, very interesting. Very interesting. I don't see. Oh, okay. Yes, somebody is asking. Hello, uh, Giuseppe. So my understanding is that to move to complete autonomy, one of the next steps would be to move away from motion capture labs and perform onboard state estimations. I was wanting to get your insight on the direction of the research for this. Yeah. So in my in my opinion, yeah, this is this is this is totally right. I mean, and we have seen uh, you know many works that try to deploy. Uh, this kind of algorithm, I'm, I'm talking about the classic one, not this, not this one that I was, you know, mentioning about learning models and so on. The classic ones, you know, work quite well. I think there is still a big problems in terms of, you know, robustness uh, for for this type of algorithm. So when you go in really specific conditions, uh, these algorithms, you know, do not perform uh, as good as they were performing. Uh, you know, in in uh, in in the settings where you previously tried, and especially this happens, you know, in in, in dynamic conditions. So I think honestly, there is a lot of work probably to do, to be done to deal with dynamic environment. I think that's that's definitely interesting. But from a static perspective, I you know, it's a matter of robustness at that point to specific uh, cases. And you know, then there is the usual question: Is this really you know, work for academic work or it should be done 
uh, it's more industry. Uh, but then these, uh, you know, I, I, I leave it to you. I think you, uh, you know, it depends also on your interest on what kind of research, uh, you know, you are mostly interested in. How adaptive sensitive. Thank you. Yeah. How adaptive sensitive uncertainty aware NPC. So that's very specific. Is to environmental disturbances external to system dynamics. So we noticed that you know um, it's sensitive enough, but it was not consistent across the disturbances. So in many cases, you know, it was acting uh, better than others. This is also due to the fact that we also keep a memory in the network. So we don't change the weights for all the layers when we do that type of adaptation, but we change the last or the latest two layers of the network to do that type of adaptation. Otherwise, you know, you may you may run into things that uh, have convergence problems uh, and so on. So we keep a sort of prior uh, within the network and then we just update uh, the latest layer. But if you want, you know, more capability of adaptation, certainly you can definitely increase the number of layers that you are changing. Uh, that's uh, that's a possibility. Or, you know, you can also increase the network size. But in that case, it wouldn't run anymore uh, on embedded platform, basically. Thank you. Just and honestly, I was very other... surprised when a complete neural network was was uh, was running the quadrotor. <laughs> but again, okay. that is you know very different from what people do in end to end. So it's basically a modular approach, but with learning in the loop, so we can clearly understand if something doesn't work, where the problem is. So in this case, if something doesn't work, most likely the problem is in the model that's you know not estimating things correctly. Thank you. This was a great answer. Let's see if there is any other question, either from live audience or also on the chat. Massimo seems to have a question. Go ahead. Can, I, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. yes. Hi, Giuseppe. Thanks uh, for your presentation. Very interesting. Hello. Uh, um, I have a specific question related to the last um, task that you presented, the last application. Uh, it seems that you are able to detect the, let's say, the interaction, the human interaction very fast. So I, I miss something. I, I mean, uh, did you uh, put a sensor on the cable or you just estimate this as a, a disturbance uh, on each of the quadrotor, let's say? So what we do there is that we estimate, we are able to estimate the tension from each one of the uh, robot. So <clears throat> using motor speed and so on, and then combining this tension using, there are some observer, but in our case, we use a quasi-static approach using the system dynamics and so on. We are able to retrieve the uh, uh, force and moments that are applied to the structure. And we compare those with uh, with uh, you know uh, an original uh, real force sensors that we put on the system, and they are very close. I mean, they are quite good. And so, if we have accurate you know tension uh, estimation, basically indirectly, you can understand you know what are the uh, external forces and moment that are applied to the system. Of course, I mean, in this case, we assume a single disturbance. That's the human. If you have something else like you know wind or uh, other types of effects, those will be all incorporated in the same kind of uh, uh, estimation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Massimo, for the question. Um, let's see, there's time for uh, maybe a last question. If not, I think we can send Giuseppe to the rest of the day. <laughs> Busy <You're> day. <laughs> In Washington Square, right? Yes, that's, <laughs> like uh, that's a beautiful place with Fifth Avenue. And so, so yeah, I told you, welcome to visit anytime. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> I really look forward to coming visiting. Well, thank you again for, for the great talk. Um, uh, I think thank people can follow up if you have uh, deeper questions. Thank you. And, uh, and see you all next week for the next autonomy talk. Thank you. Bye. Have a great day and rest of the week. Thank you.